The Fireplace by Henry S. Whitehead Read by Ben Tucker When the Planters Hotel in Jackson, Mississippi burned to the ground in the notable fire of 1922, the loss to that section of the South could not be measured in terms of that ancient hostelry's former grandeur. The days indeed had long passed when a Virginia ham was therein stewed in no medium meaner than good white wine, and as the rambling old building was heavily insured, the owners suffered no great material loss. The real loss was the community's. In the deaths by fire of two of its prominent citizens, Lieutenant Governor Frank Stackpole and Mayor Cassius L. Turner. These gentlemen, just turning elderly, had been having a reunion in the hotel with two of their old associates, Judge Varney J. Baker of Memphis, Tennessee, and the Honorable Valdemar Peel, a prominent Georgian from Atlanta. Thus, two other southern cities had a share in the morning, for Judge Baker and Mr. Peel both likewise perished in the flames. The fire took place just before Christmas, on the 23rd of December, and among the many sympathetic and regretful comments which ensued upon this holocaust was the many times repeated conjecture that these gentlemen had been keeping a kind of Christmas anniversary, a fact which added no little to the general feeling of regret and horror. On the request of these prominent gentlemen, the hotel management had cleared out and furnished a second-floor room with a great fireplace, a room for long used only for storage but for which the late mayor and lieutenant governor had assured them the four old cronies cherished a certain sentiment. The fire, which gained headway despite the truly desperate efforts of the occupants of the room, had its origin in the fireplace, and it was believed that the four, who were literally burned to cinders, had been trapped. The fire had started, it appeared, about half an hour before midnight, when everybody else in the hotel had retired. No other occupant of the house suffered from its effects, beyond a few incidental injuries sustained in the hurried departure at dead of night from the blazing old fire trap. Some ten years before this regrettable incident ended the long and honorable career of this one-time famous hostelry, a certain Mr. James Callender, breaking a wearisome journey north at Jackson, turned into the hospitable vestibule of the planters with a sigh of relief. He had been shut up for nine hours and the mephitic atmosphere of a soft coal train. He was tired, hungry, thirsty, and begrimed with soot. Two grinning negro porters deposited his ample luggage, toted from the railway station in the reasonable hope of a large emolument, promised by their patron's prosperous appearance and the eminence of the festival season of Christmas. They received their reward and left Mr. Callender in the act of signing the hotel register. Can you let me have number 28, he required of the clerk. That, I believe, is the room with the large fireplace, is it not? My friend Mr. Tom Culbertson of Sweetbriar recommended it to me in case I should be stopping here. Number 28 was fortunately vacant, and the new guest was shortly in occupation, a great fire at his orders roaring up the chimney, and he himself engaged in preparing for the luxury of a hot bath. After a leisurely dinner of the sort for which the old hotel was famous, Mr. Callender first sauntered slowly through the lobby, enjoying the first fragrant whiffs of a good cigar. Then, seeing no familiar face which gave promise of a conversation, he ascended to his room, replenished the fire, and got himself ready for a solitary evening. Soon in pajamas, bathrobe, and comfortable slippers, he settled himself in a comfortable chair at just the right distance from the fire, and began to read a new book which he had brought with him. His dinner had been a late one, and it was about half-past nine when he really settled to his book. It was Arthur Mockin's House of Souls, and Mr. Callender soon found himself absorbed in the eerie ecstasy of reading, for the first time, a remarkable work which transcended all his previous second-hand experiences of the occult. It had, he found, anything but a soporific effect upon him. He was reading carefully, well into the book with all his faculties alert, when he was interrupted by a knock on the door of his room. Mr. Callender stopped reading, marked his place, and rose to open the door. He was wondering who should summon him at such an hour. He glanced at his watch on the bureau in passing and was surprised to note that it was 11.20. He had been reading for nearly two hours steadily. He opened the door and was surprised to find no one in the corridor. He stepped through the doorway and glanced right and then left. 
There were, he observed, turns in both directions at short distances from his door, and Mr. Callender, whose mind was trained in the sifting of evidence, worked out an instantaneous explanation in his mind. The occupant of a double room, so he guessed, had returned late and mistaking the room had knocked to apprise his fellow occupant of his return. Seeing at once that he had knocked prematurely on the wrong door, the person had bolted around one of the corners to avoid an awkward explanation. Mr. Callender, smiling at this whimsical idea of his, turned back into his room and shut the door behind him. A gentleman was sitting in the place he had vacated. Mr. Callender stopped short and stared at this intruder. The man who had appropriated his comfortable chair was a few years older than himself, it appeared. Say, about thirty-five. He was tall, well-proportioned, and very well-dressed, although there seemed to Mr. Callender's hasty scrutiny something indefinably odd about his clothes. The two men looked at each other appraisingly for the space of a few seconds in silence, and then abruptly Mr. Callender saw what was wrong with the other's appearance. He was dressed in the fashion of about fifteen years back, in the style of the late nineties. No one was wearing such a decisive-looking Piccadilly collar, nor such a huge puff tie which concealed every vestige of the linen except the edges of the cuffs. These, on Mr. Callender's uninvited guest, were immaculate and round, and held in place by a pair of large, round, cut cameo black buttons. The strange gentleman, without rising, broke the silence in a well-modulated voice, with a deprecatory wave of a very well-kept hand. "'I owe you an apologist, sir. I trust that you will accept what amends I can make. This room has for me a peculiar interest which you will understand if you will allow me to speak further.' but for the present I confine myself to asking your pardon. This speech was delivered in so frank and pleasing a fashion that Mr. Callender could take no offense at the intrusion of the speaker. You are quite welcome, sir, but perhaps you will be good enough to continue as you suggest. I confess to being mightily puzzled as to the precise manner in which you came to be here. The only way of approach is through the door, and I'll take my oath no one came through it. I heard a knock, went to the door, and there was no one there. I imagine I would do well to begin at the beginning, said the stranger gravely. The facts are somewhat unusual, as you will see when I have related them. Otherwise, I should hardly be here, at this time of night, and trespassing upon your good nature. That this is no mere prank, I beg that you will believe. Proceed, sir, by all means, returned Mr. Callender, his curiosity aroused and keen. He drew up another chair and seated himself on the side of the fireplace opposite the stranger, who had once began his explanation. "'My name is Charles Bellinger, a fact which I will ask you kindly to note and keep well in mind. I come from Biloxi, down on the Gulf, and unlike yourself, I am a southerner, a native of Mississippi. You see, sir, I know something about you, or at least who you are.' Mr. Callender inclined his head, and the stranger waved his hand again, this time as if to express acknowledgment of an introduction. I may as well add to this, since it explains several matters, though in itself sounding somewhat odd, that actually I am dead. Mr. Bellinger, at this astounding statement, met Mr. Callender's facial expression of amazement with a smile clearly meant to be reassuring, and again with a kind of unspoken eloquence waved his expressive hand. Yes, sir, what I tell you is the plain truth. I passed out of this life in this room where we are sitting almost exactly sixteen years ago. My death occurred on the 23rd of December. That will be precisely sixteen years ago, the day after tomorrow. I came here tonight for the express purpose of telling you the facts, if you will bear with me, and suspend your judgment as to my sanity. It was I who knocked at your door, and I passed through it, and, so to speak, through you, my dear sir. On the late afternoon of the day I've mentioned, I arrived in this hotel in company with Mr. Frank Stackpool, an acquaintance who still lives here in Jackson. I met him as I got off the train and invited him to come here with me for dinner. Being a bachelor, he made no difficulty, and just after dinner, we met in the lobby another man named Turner, Cassius L. Turner, also a Jacksonian, who proposed a game of cards and offered to secure two more gentlemen to complete the party. I invited him to bring them here to my room, and Stackpool and I came up in advance to get things ready for an evening of poker. 
Shortly afterwards, Mr. Turner and the two other gentlemen arrived. One of them was named Baker. The other was Mr. Valdemar Peel of Atlanta, Georgia. You recognize his name, I perceive, as I had expected you would. Mr. Peel is now a very prominent man. He has gone far since that time. If you happened to be better acquainted here, you would know that Stackpool and Turner are also men of very considerable prominence. Baker, who lives in Memphis, Tennessee, is likewise a well-known man in his community and state. Peel, it appeared, was Stackpool's brother-in-law, a fact which I had not previously known, and all four were well acquainted with each other. I was introduced to the two newcomers, and we commenced to play poker. Somewhat to my embarrassment, since I was both the host and the stranger of the party, I won steadily from the very beginning. Mr. Peel was the heaviest loser. And although as the evening wore on, he sat with compressed lips and made no comment, it was plain that he was taking his considerable losses rather hardly. Not long after eleven o'clock, a most unfortunate incident took place. I had in no way suspected that I was not among gentlemen. I had begun, you see, by knowing only Stackpool, and even with him my acquaintance was only casual. At the time I mentioned there began a round of jackpots, and the second of these I opened with a pair of kings and a pair of fours. Hoping to better my hand, I discarded the fours with the odd card, and drew to the pair of kings, hoping for a third. I was fortunate. I obtained not only the third king, but with it a pair of eights. Thus equipped with a full house, I considered my hand likely to be the best, and when within two rounds of betting the rest had laid down their hands, the pot lay between Peel and me. Peel, I noticed, had also thrown down three cards, and every chance indicated that I had him beaten. I forced him to call me after a long series of raises back and forth, and when he laid down his hand, he was holding four fours. You see, he had picked up my discard. Wishing to give Peel the benefit of any possible doubt, I declared the matter at once, for one does not lightly accuse a gentleman of cheating at cards especially here in the South. It was possible, though far from likely, that there had been a mistake. The dealer might for once have laid down his draw on the table, although he had consistently handed out the cards as we dealt in turn all evening. To imply further that I regarded the matter as nothing worse than a mistake I offered at once to allow the considerable pot, which I had really won, to lie over to the next hand. I had risen slightly out of my chair as I spoke, and before anyone could add a word, Peel leaned over the table and stabbed me with a bowie knife, which I had not even seen him draw. So rapidly was his action. He struck upwards, slottingly, and the blade, entering my body just below the ribs, cut my right lung nearly in two. I sank down limp across the table, and within a few seconds had coughed myself almost noiselessly to death. The actual moment of dissolution was painful to a degree. It was as if the permanent part of me, myself, my soul, if you will, snapped abruptly away from that distorted thing which sprawled prone across the disordered table and which no longer moved. Dispassionately, then, the something which continued to be myself, though now, of course, dissociated from what had been my vehicle of expression, my body, looked on and apprehended all that followed. For a few moments there was utter silence, and Turner in a hoarse, constrained voice whispered to Peel, You've done for yourself now, you unmentionable fool. Peel sat in silence, the knife which he had automatically withdrawn from the wound still grasping in his hand, and what had been my life's blood slowly dripping from it, and gradually congealing as it fell upon a disarranged pile of cards. Then, quite without warning, Baker took charge of the situation. He had kept very quiet and played a very conservative game throughout the evening. This affair calls for careful handling, he drawled, and if you will take my advice, I think it can be made into a simple case of disappearance. Bellinger comes from Biloxi. He is not well known here. Then, rising and gathering the attention of the others, he continued, I'm going down to the hotel kitchen for a short time. While I'm gone, keep the door shut, keep quiet, and clear up the room, leaving this. He indicated my body, 
where it lies. You, Stackpool, arranged the furniture in the room as nearly as you can remember how it looked when you first came in. You, Turner, make up a big fire. You needn't begin that just yet. He threw at Peel, who had begun nervously to cleanse the blade of his knife on a piece of newspaper. And with this cryptic remark, he disappeared through the door and was gone. The others, who all appeared somewhat dazed, set about their appointed task silently. Peel, who seemed unable to leave the vicinity of the table, at which he kept throwing glances, straightened up the chairs, replaced them where they had been, and then gathered up the cards and other debris from the table, and threw these into the now blazing fire which Turner was rapidly feeding with fresh wood. Within a few minutes, Baker returned as unobtrusively as he had left, and after carefully fastening the door and approaching the table, gathered the three others about him and produced from under his coat an awkward and hastily wrapped package of newspapers. Unfastening this, he produced three heavy kitchen knives. I saw that Turner went white as Baker's idea dawned upon his consciousness. I now understood what Baker had meant when he told Peel to defer the cleansing of his bowie knife. It was as plans go, a very practical scheme which he had evolved. The body, the corpus delecti, as I believe you gentlemen of the law call it, was an extremely awkward fact. It was a fact which had to be accounted for, unless, well, Baker had clearly perceived that there must be no corpus delecti. He held a hurried, low-voiced conversation with the others, from the immediate effect of which all, even Peel at first, drew back. I need not detail it to you. You will have already apprehended what Baker had in mind. There was the roaring fire in the fireplace. That was his means of making certain that there would remain no corpus delecti in that room when the others left. Without such evidence, that is, the actual body of the murdered man, there could be, as you are of course well aware, no prosecution, because there would be no proof that the murder had ever been committed. I should simply have disappeared. He had seen all that, and the opportunity which the fireplace afforded for carrying out his plan all at once. But the fireplace, while large, was not large enough to accommodate the body of a man intact, hence his hurried and stealthy visit to the hotel kitchen. The men looked up from their conference. Peel was trembling palpably. The sweat streamed from Turner's face. Stackpool seemed unaffected, but I did not fail to observe that the hand which he reached out for one of the great meat knives shook violently, and that he was the first to turn his head aside when Baker, himself pale and with set face, gingerly picked up from the table one of the stiffening hands. Within an hour and a quarter, for the fireplace drew as well then as it does tonight, there was not a vestige left of the corpus delecti, except the teeth. Baker appeared to think of everything. When the fire had pretty well burned itself out and had consumed what had been placed within it piecemeal, he remade it, and within its heart placed such charred remnants of the bones as had not been completely incinerated the first time. Eventually all the incriminating evidence had been consumed. It was as if I had never existed. My clothes, of course, had been burned. When the four, now haggard with their ordeal, had completed the burning process, another clearing up and final rearrangement of the room was undertaken. Various newspapers, which they had been carrying in their coat pockets, were used to cleanse the table. The knives, including peels, were washed and scrubbed. The water poured out, and the water basin thoroughly scoured. No blood had got upon the carpet. My not inconsiderable winnings, as well as the coin and currency which had been in my possession, were then cold-bloodedly divided among these four rascals, for such I had for some time now recognized them as being. There arose then the problem of the disposal of my other belongings. There was my watch, pocket knife, and several old seals which had belonged to my grandfather, in which I had been accustomed to wear on the end of the chain in the pocket opposite that in which I carried my watch. There were my studs, scarf pin, cuff buttons, two rings, and lastly my teeth. These had been laid aside at the time when Baker had carefully raked 
the charred but indestructible teeth out of the embers of the first fire. At this point in his narrative, Mr. Bellinger paused and passed one of his eloquent hands through the hair on top of his head in a reflective gesture. Mr. Callender observed what he had not before clearly noted, that his guest possessed a pair of extraordinarily long, thin hands, very muscular, the hands of an artist and also of a man of determination and action. He particularly observed that the index fingers were almost if not quite as long as the middle fingers. The listener, who had been unable to make up his mind upon the question of the sanity of him who had presented this extraordinary narrative in so calm and convincing a fashion, viewed these hands indicative of a strong character with the greatest interest. Mr. Bellinger resumed his narrative. There was some discussion about the disposal of all these things. The consensus was that they must be concealed since they could not easily be destroyed. If I had been one of those men, I should have insisted upon throwing them into the river at the earliest opportunity. They could have been carried out of the room by any one of the group with the greatest ease and with no chance of detection, since altogether they took up very little room. But this simple plan seemed not to occur to them. Perhaps they had exhausted their ingenuity in the horrible task just finished and were over-anxious to depart. They decided only upon the necessity of disposal of these trinkets, and the actual disposition was haphazard. This was by method which I need not describe, because I think it desirable to show them to you. Mr. Bellinger rose and led the way to a corner of the room, closely followed by the amazed calendar. Bellinger pointed to the precise corner. Although I am for the present materialized, he remarked. You will probably understand that this whole proceeding is in the nature of a severe psychic strain upon me and my resources. It is quite out of the question for me to do certain things. Managing to knock at the door took it out of me, rather, but I wish to give you as much warning of my presence as I could. Will you kindly oblige me by lifting the carpet at this point? Mr. Callender worked his fingers nervously under the corner of the carpet and pulled. The tax yielded after several hard pulls, and the corner of the carpet came up, revealing a large piece of heavy tin which had been tacked down over an ancient rat hole. "'Pull up the tin, too, if you please,' requested Mr. Bellinger. The tin presented a more difficult task than had the carpet, but Mr. Callender, now thoroughly intrigued, made short work of it, though at the expense of two broken blades of his pocket knife. At Mr. Bellinger's further direction, inserting his hand, he found and drew out a packet of cloth which proved on examination to have been fabricated out of a trouser's pocket lining. The cloth was rotted and brittle, and Mr. Callender carried it carefully over to the table and laid it down, and emptying it out between them, checked off the various articles which Mr. Bellinger had named. The round cuff buttons came last, and as he held these in his hand he looked at Mr. Bellinger's wrists. Mr. Bellinger smiled and pulled down his cuffs, holding out his hands in the process, and Mr. Callender again noted carefully their peculiarities, the long, muscular fingers being especially conspicuous, thus seen under the direct light of the electric lamp. The cuff buttons, he noted, were absolutely identical. "'Perhaps you will oblige me by putting the whole collection in your pocket,' suggested Mr. Bellinger." Then smiling, as Mr. Callender not unnaturally hesitated, "'Take them, my dear man, take them freely. They're really mine to give, you know.' Mr. Callender stepped over to the wardrobe where his clothes hung and placed the packet in his coat pocket. When he returned to the vicinity of the fireplace, his guest had already resumed his seat. "'I trust,' he said, "'that despite the very singular, I may say, bizarre character of my narrative,' and especially the statement with which I thought best to begin it, you will have given me your credence. It is uncommon to be confronted with the recital of such an experience as I have related to you, and it is not everybody who is, may I say, privileged to carry on an extended conversation with a man who has been dead sixteen years. My object may possibly have suggested itself to you, These men have escaped all consequences of their act. They are, as I think you will not deny, four thorough rascals. They are at large and even in positions of responsibility, trust, and prominence in their several communities. 
You are a lawyer, a man held in high esteem for your professional skill and personal integrity. I ask you then, will you undertake to bring these men to justice? You should be able to reproduce the salient points of my story. You have even proofs in the shape of the articles now in your coat pocket. There is the fact of my disappearance. That made a furor at the time, and has never been explained or cleared up. You have the evidence of the hotel register for my being here on that date, and it would not be hard to prove that these men were in my company. But above all else, I would pin my faith for a conviction upon the mere recounting in the presence of these four duly subpoenaed of my story as I have told it to you. That would fasten their guilt upon them to the satisfaction of any judge and jury. They would be crying aloud for mercy and groveling in abject superstitious fear long before you had finished the account of precisely what they had done. Or three of them could be confronted with an alleged confession made by the other. Will you undertake to right this festering wrong, Mr. Callender, and give me peace? Your professional obligation to promote justice and set wrong right should conspire with your character to cause you to agree. I will do so with all my heart, replied Mr. Callender, holding out his hand. But before the other could take it, there came another knocking on the door of the hotel room. Slightly startled, Mr. Callender went to the door and threw it open. One of the hotel servants reminded him that he had asked to be called and that it was the hour specified. Mr. Callender thanked and feed the man, and turning back into the room found himself alone. He went to the fireplace and sat down. He looked fixedly at the smoldering fire in the grate. He went over to the wardrobe and felt in his coat pocket in search of negative evidence that he had been dreaming, but his hand encountered the bag which had been the lining of a trouser's pocket. He drew it out and spread a second time that morning on the table the various articles which it contained. After an early breakfast, Mr. Callender asked for permission to examine the register for the year 1896. He found that Charles Bellinger of Biloxi had registered on the afternoon of the 23rd of December, and had been assigned room 28. He had no time for further inquiries, and thanking the obliging clerk, he hastened to the railway station and resumed his journey north. During the journey, his mind refused to occupy itself with anything except his strange experience. He reached his destination in a state of profound preoccupation. As soon as his professional engagements allowed him the leisure to do so, he began his inquiries by having looked up the owners of those names which were deeply imprinted in his memory. He was obliged to stop there because of an unprecedented quantity of new legal business claimed his more immediate attention. He was aware that this particular period in his professional career was one vital to his future, and he slaved painstakingly at the affairs of his clients. His diligence was rewarded by a series of conspicuous legal successes, and his reputation became greatly enhanced. This heavy preoccupation could not fail to dull somewhat the sharp impression which the adventure in the hotel bedroom had made upon his mind, and the contents of the trousers' pocket remained locked in his safe deposit box, undisturbed, while he settled the affairs of the Rockland Oil Corporation and fought through the appellate division the conspicuous case of Burnett versus De Castro, etc. It was in the pursuit of a vital piece of evidence in this last named case that his duties called him south again. Having obtained the evidence, he started home, and again found it expedient to break the long journey northward at Jackson. It was not, though, until he was actually signing the register that he noted that it was the 23rd of December, the actual date with which Mr. Bellinger's singular narrative had been concerned. He did not ask for any particular room this time. He felt a chill of vague apprehension, as if there awaited him an accounting for some laxity, a feeling which recalled the occasional lapses of his remote childhood. He smiled, but this whimsical idea was quickly replaced by a somber apprehension which he could not shake off and which emanated from the realization that the clerk, by some strange fatality, had again assigned him room 28, the room with the fireplace. He thought of asking for another room, but could not think of any reasonable excuse. He sighed and felt a positive sinking at the heart when he saw the figures written down at the edge of the page, but he said nothing. If he shrank from this room's occupancy, 
this room with its frightful secret shared by him alone of this world's company with the four guilty men who were still at large because of his failure to keep his promise. He was human enough and moderate enough in his ideas to shrink still more from the imputation of oddity which his refusal of the room on no sensible grounds would inevitably suggest. He went up to his room, and as it was a cold night outside, ordered the fire to be made up. When the hotel servant rapped on his door in the morning, there was no answer, and after several attempts to arouse the occupant, the man reported his failure at the office. Later, another attempt was made, and this proving equally ineffectual, the door was forced with the assistance of a locksmith. Mr. Callender's body was found lying with the head in the grate. He had been, it appeared, strangled, for the marks of a pair of hands were deeply imprinted on his throat. The fingers had sunk deeply into the bluish, discolored flesh, and the coroner's jury noted the unusual circumstance when they sent out a description of the murderer confined to this peculiarity that these marks indicated that the murderer who was never discovered possessed very long, thin fingers, the index fingers being almost or quite as long as the middle fingers. End of the Fireplace by Henry S. Whitehead